Hey, I'm here in London, England, in front of the London Eye. And what we're going to do here is model the height of a rider using trig functions. The London Eye is quite an impressive looking structure. It opened at the turn of the millennium and at the time was the tallest Ferris wheel in the world. Pretty amazing, eh? It's like a giant bicycle wheel. Look at it, all the little spokes. Look at the big hub in the middle. Now, to model the motion of riders as they revolve around, we're going to need to know a few numbers. The structure is 135 meters tall, and the wheel itself has a diameter of 120 meters. And it moves fairly slowly. It takes around 30 minutes to make one complete rotation. This video is sped up, so it moves even more slowly than what you see here. Now, to see why we can use a trig function to model the motion of riders as they travel around, I have an animation here that will hopefully help. You can see that the top of the wheel here is at 135 meters on this scale over here. And that value would be to the top of the pods that are attached around the edge of this wheel. And in reality, the riders are standing inside the pods, so they probably wouldn't exactly quite get up to 135 meters but we're going to ignore that here. And it's not entirely clear exactly where the 120 meter diameter is measured from, but for the purposes of this, we're going to assume it means between the low and high points that the riders get to. While that might not exactly be the case, the focus here is on modeling more than the specificity of the values involved. So using those values, 135 meters up to the top, and the diameter of this circle is 120 meters, means that this low point where the riders get on is 15 meters above the ground level or the lowest level where those measurements are made from. And so our starting point on this graph over here is the rider is at a low point of 15. And the highest they're gonna go is up to 135 here. So if we watch as the rider goes around here, they get up to the top and that graph gets to a maximum and then it gets back down to the bottom, a minimum, and so on, another maximum. Now, I've got this rider going around several times. In reality, you would only get one time around the wheel, but we want to see more of the graph, so we're assuming that this rider is lucky enough to get to go around multiple times here. All right, so you see that every 30 minutes, they get back to where they started, right, because it takes one 30-minute period to go all the way around once. You see that the maximum height they ever get to is that 135 and the minimum they come back to every time is 15 meters there. So to model this we're gonna write an equation for height as a function of time. I'm gonna use H for height and T for time. Before we do that let's just make a list of the aspects of this curve that we know. The first thing is that we see that the period of this graph, the length of one complete cycle of this curve is 30, right? So we're going to say our period is 30 minutes. And also we have our amplitude here. Now our amplitude is the distance from the center up to the top or the center to the bottom. Now that's just the radius of the wheel, right? center to top or center to bottom is the radius of the wheel. We know the diameter of the wheel is 120. So our amplitude is half of that or 60. We also need to know this value right there, the halfway point. Now I just drew that there. And the reason I know it's there, it's actually at 75 is because it's halfway between the top and the bottom. And the top over here is 135 and the bottom is 15, and the halfway point of those two things is 75. If you're not sure what that is, you can work it out just by finding the average of those two, right? So you can say, we're gonna say vertical displacement is 15 plus 135 divided by two, which is 150 over two, which is 75. And the last thing we have to determine is if there's any kind of horizontal shift here, now to do that, we have to decide what base function we're using. Now the best base function here is one where we can actually use one here that is not gonna involve a horizontal shift at all. Since we start at the bottom here, the bottom at a low point, 
we can use cosine with a vertical reflection. Or in other words, we can use negative cosine as our base function here because we start at a low point. If we were going to start at a high point and use positive cosine, we'd have to have a phase shift. We'd have to shift it 15 to the right, which isn't too hard, but it's easier if we can avoid doing that. So I'm going to choose to use negative cosine as my base function here. So to write our function, essentially what we're doing h for height, that's like our y value. We need an a value. We're going to use cosine. We need a b value here using t, like our x value. There's no horizontal shift, so I'm not going to put a c value in there like that. I'm just going to leave it like this. And then we need a vertical shift, that d value there. So we have to put a value for each of those three things. Some of them we just substitute directly in, like more or less the first one here. The a value, well, we said we needed to be negative if we're not going to have a horizontal shift. And that a value is the amplitude, so negative 60 cos. And the b value is related to the period. We don't just put this number in there, though. The b value is 2 pi divided by the period. So 2 pi over 30 is what we put in there. 2 pi over 30 times time. If you want to put some brackets around it like that, you can. But you don't have to since it's all multiplied there. And then the value of d, the vertical shift, we said that vertical displacement was 75. So that is our function right there. Now that we have our model function, we can use it to calculate values. For example, what's a rider's height, say, 12 minutes after they start? Now, what we're looking for in this situation, essentially, is we want to find what the h value is when the t value, time, is 12. Now, from the graph, you can see, say, 12 is somewhere there. And if we go up here, it's going to be somewhere in that neighborhood like that. But we can find it exactly, algebraically, just by substituting in 12 here in our equation. So if we put a 12 there and then just calculate the value. So in other words, negative 60 cos 2 pi over 30 times 12. If you want to put multiplication with those extra set of brackets, there you can. If you don't like that double round bracket, you could either put square brackets, or if you prefer to write it without brackets inside there, you can just put a multiplication sign or whatever whatever you like. If you work that out, you're going to find that it's approximately 123.5. And so we can say we have a height of about 124 meters. I'm saying about partly because we rounded it off, the value we got, but also because we used values that we found on the internet, but we're not quite sure exactly where they were measured from and stuff. So it's possible that this is even maybe too accurate, but you certainly wouldn't want to go more than that. We won't worry about it again because the focus is on how to do this, not about the specific values. Now, one other thing to note here is when you're working this out on a calculator, first of all, you need to make sure your calculator is in radian mode. This whole model function is based on trig functions with radians. And then number two, when you're calculating this, if you're putting this whole thing in in one step, calculating it in one go, you got to be careful about how you're using brackets and everything there. So let's say you missed that bracket, putting that in. If you missed that bracket, your calculator would probably interpret that you meant to put it there, and then it would give you the wrong value, right? Because it would be cosine of that whole thing. So make sure you're careful as you do that. I would encourage you to try and see what you get when you put that in. Just confirm that you can get the value that we have there. Now here we're asked to find out how long riders are higher than 100 meters above the ground. And this is actually the reverse of what we just did in the previous part. Previous part, we were given a time of 12 minutes and we were asked to find the height that goes with that, right? So essentially find a Y value given an X value, or in this case, H from T. Now we're asked the reverse of that. We're given a Y value, or in this case, an H value, and we're asked to find what x value or t value goes with that. Now something to recognize from this that you may already be aware of is when you take a y value or h value for a sine or cosine function, there's lots of x values or t values that go with that. So if we go across here, 
there's one value that we're looking for that goes with 100 and there's another value that goes with 100 and so on. You could keep going, it would be infinite as long as someone was going around. Now in this case we said riders usually only go around once so we're going to ignore this part of the graph and we're just going to say that the period of time that they're higher than 100 meters is the period in between those two times. That's where the heights are above 100. And so we need to determine those two times and we can subtract them. Now I'm going to call those two times, I'm going to call the first one T1, call the second one T2, and then once we have those two times we can subtract them. Now to find them we can do something similar to what we did in the previous part which is substitute a value and then solve for the unknown that's left. So in this case, we are wanting to find t when h equals something, h equals 100. So we're going to substitute 100 in for h there, and then we're going to solve the equation that results. I'll just write the rest of it down here. Now to solve that equation, we want to isolate this variable. And in doing that, we're first going to want to isolate this expression, and then we can work with that expression. Now to isolate that expression I've highlighted in yellow, we need to get rid of this minus 60 and this plus 75 here. And we can do inverse operations to do that. The first thing we're gonna get rid of is this 75. Now if you wanna write down that we're gonna subtract 75 from both sides, you can do that. You don't have to write that if you don't want. This is gonna make that disappear. And then on the other side we have 100 minus 75 is 25. And then we have, of course, this part that remains here, cosine of 2 pi over 30 times time. And to keep going in isolating that expression, and to get rid of our negative 60, you don't add 60, it's multiplied in here, right? So we divide by negative 60, divide by negative 60. So on the left, you have negative 25 over 60. And on the right, we just have cos 2 pi over 30 times time. Now that we have the cosine expression isolated, we're going to determine what this inside expression is equivalent to. We're going to do that by using the cos inverse function. If cosine of that expression is negative 25 over 60, then that expression inside there, we are going to get at by using cos inverse. And the method I'm going to use is to put the negative in like this and get the result solve for t and interpret what it means on my graph. Now our last step to isolate t here is to divide by that value that it is multiplied by. So t is going to be cos inverse negative 25 over 60 divided by 2 pi over 30. When you go and do that, you get a time value that is approximately 9.55. Now to see what that represents, we're going to go back to the graph here. What that represents is actually time one on our graph. Time one is 9.55. You can see that that kind of makes sense in the situation because at 15 minutes you're up at 135 and you know halfway before that at seven and a half minutes you're only at 75 meters and so 100 meters somewhere in between there that makes sense. Now to find the other time, time two, the way we're going to do that is to use the symmetry of this graph. If you imagine a line right down the middle there, it's symmetric left to right, and we can use that to figure out our time. If we know that this value that it took to go from there up to there, the first part of that graph is 9.55 minutes, then because of the symmetry, it's going to take the same length of time for that part of the trip, the coming back down from that height. So if this section right over here is 9.55, then if we want this value up to here, we can just take 30 minutes there and we can subtract 9.55. All right, when we do that, so we're going to write down here, time one was roughly 9.55 and time two, we're going to get by taking 30 minutes and subtracting that 9.55. And so what you get is that's actually 20.45. So we have our two values there, 9.55 and 20.45, and we said to find the time that we're looking for here, we want the time in between there, so if we subtract those two, we'll get our answer. So we're going to say time above 100 meters is approximately 20.45 
minus 9.55, which is 10.9 minutes. All right, so we got approximately 10.9 minutes. You could even just call it 11 minutes because of the approximate nature of the values we used, as we said before, all right? Now, what we've done in these last two parts here is one approach to solving this. This is the algebraic approach to solving, where we substitute in a value and we solve for the variable that remains in the equation. We can also solve things graphically, which is what we're gonna do next. Now, to solve the two parts that we just did graphically, you can use a graphing calculator or graphing app graphing software. I'm going to use Desmos here, but it's a similar process on any of those things. First of all, you need to put in your function. I am going to use y and x here instead of h and t because it's going to be more straightforward for what we're doing. So instead of h, y equals negative 60 cosine. We had 2 on here. I have to go down to this menu to find the pi. And then I'm going to put divided by 30. Now, I can put my x beside this like this, or you can put it up on top. It really doesn't matter. And then, of course, we have our plus 75. Now, you might say, where's the graph? But it's there. It's just we can't see it right now. We need to change the dimensions of our graph. So I'm going to move that over. First of all, maybe let's get the height right here because we knew our height was between 15 and 135, so I can do that. If you're using Desmos, what I'm doing right now is I'm changing the vertical without changing the horizontal. On a computer, you hold down the Shift key and then you put your mouse on the Y axis and squish it down. You can do the same thing with the X axis here. I wanna squish it horizontally. If I push the Shift key, I, that axis turns blue and then I can drag it in like this and I can see that that's probably good enough because all we need is one cycle of the graph. On a phone, if you're doing that, you just put your fingers on the axis to be able to change one direction only. Now to solve this graphically, we have our function in there. The first part, what we want to know is we want to know the y value when x is 12. So you can just put in x equals 12. It's going to draw a vertical line there that you can see. It made it black, but if you want some other color here, you can put some other color so you can see it. And you can just click on that intersection. On a graphing calculator, you might have to push a few more buttons to get it to come up with that value. But when x is 12, y is 123.5, that value that we got. And if we want to do the second part, which is find the times that go with a height of 100 meters, we can just put in the height as 100. Or in other words, in this case, we're using Y. So Y is 100. It draws a horizontal line at 100. And we can click on our two times. We had 9.55 and uh, 20.45 there, those two values, right? Either method is a good method to solve there. If you have technology with you, use that because it's certainly a lot quicker, as you can see here but it's also good to be able to do that algebraic approach. All right, that's it.